Mike, can you do that? Okay, great. So, yeah, make sure that you can access the link that's in the chat. Everyone give a thumbs up if you're able to access the link, please. Okay. No? Yes, everyone's thumbs are up. Dana, were you able to get it? Okay. Anyone just signing in, the link is um, just posted again. And Mike, I guess maybe periodically post it until we start just for anyone that's coming in now. I guess people who just come in and don't have access to the, to the chat right. before they were here. Yes. So yeah, that's the problem. We have about 10 more, 15 more participants coming in. We can wow. maybe wait a couple of minutes. I love that you're experiencing the same issues that we do, Dr. Wenger. <laughs> Yeah, uh, we're all learning to do this, right? <laughs> oh, you're coming in just now. Please access the link in the chat to Dr. Ringer's PowerPoint. You have some cherries. Are you okay? Do you need anything? Dana, just so you know, you're not muted. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Good morning. There's a few more of us coming in. I see everyone's filling in. About five more people still coming in. If you're coming in now, please access the link in the chat. Or the PowerPoint. Just a few more people to go. Good morning, everyone. Morning. Good morning. If you're just coming in, access the link in the chat for the PowerPoint, please. So Laura, I'll let you decide when it's time to start. Okay, it'll just probably be one more minute if that's good for you. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. Actually, while we wait, if you, if you hover over your picture and you see three little dots, there's something called rename. So make sure that the name that's on your, on your um, picture is actually your name because if you, may, you may be using somebody else's account or something. And it would be good to put comma and, com, com, comma and then where you are in the world. So you will see that I've put, I've put myself as being in Portugal. So it, it's just good to know so where people are. Those are the three dots over your picture. If you click it and go to rename and just add your location after your name. Morning, everyone. Happy Friday. Happy Friday. Hello. Okay, so I'm going to officially start. Um, 
Introducing Dr. Etienne Wenger is no small feat. <laughs> I've had the pleasure of doing it several times, and each time I felt inadequate, as if I couldn't do him justice. So I searched online and for interviews or talks or how other people have introduced him and found phrases and words like globally recognized thought leader or leading expert or even pioneer. And those are terms you don't often hear today, particularly in the field of education. So one thing I didn't find that I know to be true from my own past experience, as well as those of other students who've talked to me about um, attending his talks, is that after participating in a talk with Etienne, you walk away with your brain hurting. <laughs> it's real physical pain. From... I don't mean to do that. I don't mean to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Your thinking gets extended so far, it's like a Spartan 500 race for your brain. So in the spirit of an introduction, like never before, and one I'm hoping you won't forget, I'd like a warm virtual NGCU welcome for a man who makes our brains hurt so good, Dr. Etienne Wenger. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Great. So, um, as was said before, uh, there is a link to a PowerPoint in the chat. It's in Google Drive, so you can, the best way to watch it is probably to watch it as a, as a Google slide show, um, whichever you prefer. Um, and I'll just let you know when I move from one slide to another, um, so that we can still see each other. Uh, otherwise, we can only see six people at a time if I share my screen. So I'm going to avoid sharing my screen. Yeah, I think I, I just, take, just take one minute to make sure that this doesn't happen anymore. Okay. <laughs> um, so, um, for me, what's important is not to go through the slides. What's important is to have a good conversation and, you know, to learn together. I don't learn a whole lot when I hear myself talk for one more time, but I learn a whole lot when people ask questions and say, oh, but in my work, can I use this and can I use that? So bring me into your world. And if we don't go through all the slides, it really doesn't matter. Uh, actually, the end of the the end of the uh, presentation is very much about a book that we just finished, and uh, that's coming out in September. So, if we don't go through that, it's even okay because you'll have a chance to 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 look at it. But uh, we'll we'll go for about an hour and fifteen twenty minutes. We'll take a little break because it's really important not to stay uh, looking at the screen for more than an hour or so. Uh, and at some points during the proceedings, I'll just put you in breakout rooms so that you can be with each other, share with each other what, you, what you're finding, what you are finding intriguing, what you don't understand, and then come back maybe with questions or, or other insights. So we, we'll move between a whole group and, and breakout rooms. Uh, from time to time. Any question on the process? Okay, so let's move to slide number two. Um, and basically what it says is that your learning theory is important. And everybody has a learning theory, even though we may not call it a learning theory, you know. If your child says a four-letter word at the dinner table and you look at your child with this intense look, you are a behaviorist, you know, because you, your child does something, a behavior, and you kind of punish that child by showing your, your discontentment and you hope that that child will not, never say that word again. So. You know, we could call this behaviorism, but it's important because you, you may have a, another attitude. You may think, oh, it's important to explain. 
you know, you may be cognitivist and you may think, oh, what's important is really to explain to that child uh, uh, what that word means and that in fact it's not appropriate for the table, etc., etc. Or you may be a, a constructivist and you say, oh, this child really needs to uh, uh, develop knowledge for himself or herself. We will we'll send that child into all sorts of contexts to say that word, that word to grown-ups to see how they react and uh, they will learn for themselves uh, that this word is actually creates very, very bad reaction uh, everywhere. So, they, so different learning theories will have very different implications for how you approach a learning situation. And so what I want to talk about today is really another learning theory. Uh, we call it social learning theory for two reasons is that on the one hand, as a theory, it really takes its, its foundation that we are social being and therefore learning is fundamentally social because it's through our social life that we give meaning to, to what we do. Even if you don't interact with anybody, even if you read a book, you know, that book only has meaning in the social context. Even if you're a hermit, the idea of being a hermit only makes sense in a social context. So fundamentally, we are social beings in terms of the meanings that we, that, that we construct. Um, and so that's, in that sense, it's a social learning theory, but it's also so social learning theory because it's in interaction with each other that we develop these concepts, that we learn these words and so on and so forth. Okay, any question at this point? Okay. I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, um, as so, you're saying- Take your hand so, I, so I, I know who's talking. Oh yeah, you, okay, yeah, 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 good. Yeah, Judith. <laughs> yes, um, as you're saying social learning theory, I'm also um, calling it the social cognitive theory. Are you using it in the same way? Well, so social cognitive theory, is, uh, is uh, uh, Bantura's word. Right. He, he used to call his, his work social learning theory, but he changed the name of his theory to social cognitive theory. And to just uh, uh, specify, Bandura comes out of social psychology and is much more interested in the micro um, levels of how cognition is involved in the social world. Okay, so. so we, we come from something called social theory, you know, which is kind of the, the, the philosophy under the social sciences, if you will. And so we are much more interested in how the person is constructed in social context and how learning contributes to that and how the social world is, is or is not configured in such a way that that learning is possible or impossible. Okay. So, Thank you for the clarification. Yeah. So these are, these are, these are really uh, cousins, if you will, <laughs> cousin theories, but that come from somewhat different intellectual traditions. Okay. Very good. So that, that was really useful question, thank you. Um, but I think it's also important to know that the theory has gone through phases, you know, it's not like a theory that was born plop, you know, and it's still evolving now, you know. Actually, I hope that we'll have time to get to this more recent development, uh, uh, because I think it's kind of exciting. Uh, but I think it's important to see how the learning theory has evolved and this is representing through different books. So it, it really started in an institute called the Institute for Research on Learning. And for some of you who were there, who were there in 2018, this is, this is gonna be a little bit of a, a repeat, but I think it's important for everybody to, to have that kind of foundation for our conversation. So if you, if you go to sleep or if you wanna go get a cup of tea, uh, that's all right. Uh, but this started really in an institute called the Institute for Research on Learning. And the idea of, of that institute that was studied by a man called John Seeley Brown was, A, 
learning theory influences how you support learning. The schools that we see today have a reason out of a certain learning theory. If we invent new learning theories, maybe we can invent new, new institutions, new ways of, to support learning in the world. That was the idea of this institute, Institute for Research on Learning. The institute doesn't exist anymore, but for the 10 years that it existed, it was a very uh, intellectually lovely place. Um, and uh, so the idea of an institute was to separate learning from teaching. To say, let's look at learning in and of itself. Let's theorize learning in and of itself. And then we can, we can think about teaching from that perspective on learning. So that was the idea. And they brought together scholars from different disciplines. I was coming from computer science, cognitive science and all that. Uh, but there were people from anthropology, linguistics, psychology, education, all sorts of fields. And I started to work with an anthropologist. And for me, I had always been interested in how we make meaning of, of, uh, of what we learn more than learning as repetition or regurgitation. And we thought, wow, yeah, there's, there is a, a form of learning that has preceded schooling and where the meaning of what you learn is really pretty obvious, pretty clear, and, and it's called apprenticeship. Apprenticeship is an, old, an age old way of learning and you learn in the context in which what you're, gonna, what you're learning is gonna become a way of, of living, if you will, right? And so we started to look at apprenticeship. And when we looked at apprenticeship, we noticed that most of the learning was not taking place in interaction with the master. In fact, if you're a young apprentice, and you have a problem, you don't go to the master because that's too scary. You go to someone who's a bit ahead of you and you say, hey, how do you saw this button here? You know? And so we needed a name for this set of relationships that existed around the master and we called it a committee of practice. So that is how that term was born, the committee of practice, to give a name to this social system in which there was a practice that was mostly embodied by the master, but embodied by different people at different levels of advancement. And then there was a community for whom that was the practice that they were learning, developing and so on and so forth. And so this is how, uh, or actually, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm on slide number four. Uh, this is how um, the whole thing started. Because what was interesting, first, is this idea that there was a whole community, not just a master. This idea that as you learned, you moved into the community. So at first you were very peripheral to the community, not even a member really, except that the master had accepted you as an apprentice. But the more you engaged with the community, the more you manifested the competence that is characterized by that community and the more people recognized you as a, as a member of that community. So we realized that actually competence is a manifestation of membership in a community. And actually the learning, developing a competence is actually entering a community all the way, uh, uh, Jean Liv, I was working with her, she was looking at apprentices in, in, uh, in tailoring in Africa. And one day, if you're an apprentice, you are asked to cut the fabric. So you do all sorts of things like sewing a button, getting coffee for people and whatever. But one day you are asked to cut the fabric. And if you're asked to cut the fabric, it's almost like a manifestation, uh, 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 an expression of your full membership in the community. Because if you make a mistake, it's very costly. So you don't give this to an early apprentice. And so it was interesting to think of learning as this kind of trajectory into a community to, to, be, to become like the master, if you will, and to become, and actually many of these apprentices became masters themselves uh, and had apprentices of their own. So there's a sense of 
reproduction for practice over over generations. So that was that was interesting, but it was also interesting to see how important it was that learning was always meaningful. You you learn skills, but it was always in a meaningful context, and you became a tailor. You became somebody. You didn't learn just to feel in your head. You learn because you, you wanted to become a certain kind of person. And so that, that became kind of the foundation of the theory, the idea that competence is the property of certain communities, that learning is a trajectory into these communities, and that learning transforms you as a person to become a full member of these communities. So this was kind of like the foundations that we started with. And so if you move to slide number five now, you will see some of the key concepts of that time. That was in 1987, 88, that we, that we did this work. Actually, the book was published in 1991, but it had started in 1987. So this idea that learning is situated in a meaningful practice, that was an important observation. This idea that there were old timers and newcomers, and you, you learn as you transform from an old timer, or from a, a newcomer into an old timer. That you studied at the periphery, legitimately, but at the periphery, and through participation, you became, you became a full member. It was important to have access to practice. Actually, in our book, we, we, we distinguished different communities depending on how easy it was for the apprentices to have access to the thinking of the masters. And this access to practice is very important. Actually, some people are still using that version of the theory, for instance, in medical education, to think, how does a ward give access to full practice, to authentic practice, to interns who are just, who've just had three years of classes and now all of a sudden they find themselves in a hospital. How, how do they make sense of what's going on? How is the practice made transparent? And so on and so forth. So that, those, are, those are important questions for, that, that would derive from, from that version of the theory. Okay. Breakout room, okay? Just to discuss what you've heard, okay? Uh, we're gonna do, let's say, 10 rooms of five people. Like, there are 50, 51 people on this thing. So, okay. So, you, you'll, be, you'll be put in a room, yanked into a room, and after about five, five minutes or so, I'll, I'll yank you back. It's a facilitator's dream. You know, that you can just yank people back. Otherwise, as a facilitator, you spend time bringing people into the main room, but <laughs> I'll do it. You will be given one minute warning, okay? Okay, I see some people are not going into any room. Oh, okay. Because I think that if you're on your phone, that you cannot go into a breakout room. Uh, yeah, are you on the phone? Maybe if you look on the bottom right, there should be a little grid that says breakout rooms that you should be able to join. Hi, Dr. Wenger. So we're just Hi. facilitators and we're not a part of the doctoral program, so we're just leaving it to the students to interact with. Okay, okay, okay. We're appreciating this opportunity to listen to your, your talk and, and to go through these theories. Okay. So you're working for the university as subcontractors or something? Yes. So we, both Aaron and I, are, uh, were teachers for years before entering a different role as basically a professional development um, educational solutions uh, role with a company called Edgescape. And NJCU has contracted us. We have a really good partnership with the university to facilitate their uh, doctoral program this week. Uh, so we oh, okay. uh, 
people behind the scenes running the technology, running um, Zoom and everything so that uh, the professors- Okay, so you use Zoom also as your, as your platform? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's been a great experience to see how everything comes together for them. <laughs> so we are just here to listen and to learn from you. I think, I think this is still recording, huh? This is interesting. Yeah. Yes. We'll cut this out. <laughs> okay. Okay. Hi, Mike. Sorry. No problem. Are you good to go? I, yeah. I, you know what? I got um, booted and my, for whatever reason, the Zoom wasn't working on my personal computer. So I had to dial in on my phone as well. Um, and now it looks like, I don't know what's going on. I don't know if there's like an issue with the computer and the Zoom today, but it's for whatever reason, it's being weird. So now I'm on my phone. <laughs> well, I think that if you're on your phone, as far as I can, as far as I know, you, you cannot go to a breakout room. No, I think I can. Um, I went to click it before, but then something happened and it was like, it was weird. It booted me, but I should okay. be able to. Okay. So it's not true that this idea I have that on the phone you cannot, you cannot do breakout rooms? Good. Yeah, so I saw it pop up, so it should be able to go. Where okay. in Portugal are you? I'm uh, in a place called Sesimbra. Oh, uh, is, uh, Sintra? Sesimbra. It's Sesimbra. In the Sesimbra. north? It's uh, yeah. 40 kilometers south of Lisbon. <laughs> Nice. I have a place in Villa du Conde. Oh, wow. Okay. So, anybody, any, any question came up? Any observation? Um, Dr. Langer? Oh. Go ahead, Katie. Yep. Hi, how are you? Good, um, good. One of, one of my main observations was it's so, it's interesting as we're talking about situated learning and how everybody now is an apprentice going into this online learning and this way of delivering instruction. Um, you do have those people who are a little bit more tech savvy and who are able to you know, maneuver and, and adapt quickly. And so it's gonna be interesting in September who those leaders and who those masters become um, uh -huh. and how we then can roll it back and teach the, the people who aren't so inclined to the technology. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, actually, you're anticipating the next slide, so that's interesting. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, very good, excellent. Uh, Joshua, you wanted to say something? Yes, Dr. Wang, I really appreciate this opportunity, and I appreciate how you, your uh, uh, understanding of learning being a social matter. And uh, so I'm, I'm very interested in your thoughts on the lack of effective socialization that's currently occurring and will most likely continue to occur uh, in schools, particularly where we live, where there's just such a dramatic um, upsurge of cases and, and, and there's a, you know, my, my son is just not interacting with his friends. Yeah, that is, that is probably the, the worst, the <laughs> worst part of all this. Hey, Noah. <laughs> uh, the worst part of all this, and, and uh, I, hope, I hope it doesn't last forever. The, right. cognitive, the cognitive part is probably not so problematic. Uh, but certainly the, yeah, the, the social dimension is, 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 a, is a real problem. And, uh, but, but kids are pretty good at forming social relationships on their phone. Um, you know, so so I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that uh, it's disappearing as much as, as we fear. Um, Actually, maybe sometimes when I see kids, when they are together, sitting together, they are each on their phone speaking to someone else. <laughs> so socialization is taking all sorts, of, all sorts of forms these days, yeah. So anything else before we move on? Right, let's, let's, let's move to phase two. So as Katie was saying, uh, in that view of a community of practice in phase one, you have the assumption that there is a master. You have the assumption that there is someone who knows how to do it, and then everybody else is kind of learning. But uh, in phase two, this assumption disappears because we've seen lots of communities of practice where actually there is no master. We are now in slide eight, 
And the people that you see around the table are, are um, heads of treasury in Southeast Asia. And they are sitting there uh, to discuss how to run a good treasury in those countries. And there's no master. There's nobody who knows how to do it because there are experts from ne Netherlands or something like this who, who, who do this kind of stuff. But they don't know how it's like to run it in, the, in those countries where all sorts of cultural issues around paying interest and all sorts of, uh, and, and things like that. And so these people are just acting as learning partner with each other. Nobody knows how to do it, but they think, hey, if we, if we put our brains together, we can probably learn how to do it better. So this is actually a community of practice that was pulled together by the World Bank. And these people meet every, I don't know if they still meet now, but it, when, when, when we were working with them, they were meeting every three, every three months. They were discussing things actually at that, uh, at, at that meeting, they were trying to put together a, um, a guideline for how to create a memoir of understanding with the central bank. You don't have to worry about, about that dimension of things, the details of, of that practice, but it was a difficult thing to do, you know? And so they were, some people were a bit more advanced, like Katie was saying, some people are a bit more advanced than others, but it's like the, the half blind leading the blind. Uh, <laughs> so um, they were putting some guidelines together and then they would go back home, try those guidelines, and then come back uh, and, and say, well, did it work, did it not, and refine the guidelines and so on and so forth. So what they are doing is that they are negotiating what it means to be competent. Nobody is competent, but together they are negotiating a way to recognize each other as competent participants, as competent members. And so in that, in that Phase two, a community of practice is, is just a learning partnership. And everybody contributes and some people contribute more than others, but overall, the learning partnership allows people to develop a competence that be that's better than they could just all by themselves. Sorry. Woo! Sorry, <laughs> Portuguese having discussions. So, um, yeah. So, what happened then is an interesting thing is that business took up the concept of community of practice and said, hey, we could do that. We could bring our engineers designing breaks together across the different divisions of the organizations help them be a committee of practice, and we would be able to design better breaks if they have good conversations. And so what happened in slide number nine is that all sorts of organizations started using communities of practice to create learning partnership among people. And you may not think much of it, but in fact, it is quite revolutionary in organizations that are, usually traditionally vertically organized, where the top knows and the bottom implements, to have these peer-to-peer self-organized groups in organization was kind of like, and some managers still today are not exactly comfortable with this, with this way of organizing learning inside of an organization. So, um, But, but it was kind of a wildfire, you know? And now in, in many organizations, it's, it's a matter of course that you belong to your team to do your job, but you belong to a community of practice to talk about the practice with your colleagues, you know? And actually in, in education, uh, some people are, are doing this with uh, professional learning communities. Uh, you know, you, you teach in your classroom, but you get together with some colleagues to, to try to improve the practice. You know? But it, it was interesting to see the, the diversity of organizations from Caterpillar to, to University of Southern Queensland, to Shell, to, to the World Bank, very different kinds of organizations. Also for the World Bank, you know? The World Bank, traditionally, they have experts who go to tell people what to do, 
and to bring people from different countries to figure it out together was really countercultural, you know? And sometimes it seems so, so, so common sense to do that, but it is countercultural in many, in many contexts. And so, theoretically, in this context, we started to really think about the importance of social participation in making meaning. And if you look, if you look at slide 10 now, this is an important concept, conceptual development of the theory at that stage, to think that meaning always involves the interaction, meaning making for human beings, always involves the interaction of what we call reification and what we call participation. So out of that young boy's mouth comes a thermometer and on that thermometer is a number. And that number actually have very different meaning in different practices for the doctor it's like oh he doesn't have meningitis for for the nurse it could be oh yeah we don't have to give him uh, um, um, Tylenol anymore for the parents it's like Phew, he's gonna come home soon so the same number becomes meaningful in different forms of participation and actually, in our more recent development, this notion of participation and reification are turning out to be actually our theory of memory. That we create memory over time and over space, both through our participation and through the artifacts that we create. But what's interesting theoretically is that those two things that need to be brought together to have meaning, those two things travel in time and space independently. You know? So it's interesting because you can have an archaeologist who is digging out a piece of pottery and who is kind of thinking, what form of participation would create this artifact? You see what I mean? So the participation is long gone but the artifact remains, you know. And sometimes you, you go teach, you know, but you forgot your notes, right? So you have to kind of count on your own recollection to give a meaningful, to give a, a meaningful class. So ideally you'd have your notes because if you just distributed your notes to the kids, that would not work either, you know. You need to be there to give meaning to the notes. But the notes are also very important to remember the kind of meaning that you were making when you, when you prepared your class. So these two things are really important. And, and, and when you think of one, think of the other. You know, if you send a memo to your teachers, think, okay, this memo, how is it gonna land? How is it gonna be made meaning of when it lands in a different practice, when it lands in a different context? So, if we now move to uh, slide number 11, some important concept that came out of, uh, of that phase of the theory, a definition of communities of practice as a learning partnership in terms of a joint enterprise, something that people want to do together, engage with each other in that partnership, and building a shared repertoire of concept, ideas, words, tools, and so on and so forth that embody that, that practice in, in, in concrete artifacts. Actually, when the theory moved into business, we didn't use these terms. We used domain, community, and practice. So the domain is what the, what the partnership is about. The community is how people interact with each other. And the practice is what people do. Okay, 
It's just that the system joint enterprise mutual engagement and shared repertoire didn't work in a business context. Um, so, yeah, we've talked about participation and reification as two forms of memories of meaning, if you will. Uh, and this idea that identity, practice, and competence form a kind of unit of the person in becoming. You know? This idea that learning is becoming. Now, if you, are, if you are an apprentice tailor, learning is becoming a certain kind of person that's predefined. But if you work with a committee of practice where there's no, no master, who you are becoming is something you are inventing together. So this idea that the practice, the competence in that practice and the identity that people form are, are, are a triad that go together. That was a part of the, uh, 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 at the core of this phase of the theory. And then of course, community leadership and community sponsorship in organization, this became an important concept because you may not have a master, but you may have some people who take some leadership in creating the community, in facilitating it, and so on and so forth. So this idea that, that leadership takes different form, more complex forms in a community of practice like this than when you have a single master, uh, that, that became an important dimension. So that's phase two. Uh, I, um, okay, I'm going to send you, if, if, if all goes well, you should be with different people this time. To reflect on this phase, come back with a few questions, a few observations, and we'll move on. Okay? So here we go for five minutes. Back to mute. Can we just talk about Portugal while we're, while we're waiting <laughs> and how beautiful yeah. it is? It's very hot, actually. Very hot. We're having that chilly day in New Jersey oh, really? at about 24 degrees. Yeah. Okay, I'm assuming everybody's back. So, any question, observation, stories, insights? Uh, yeah, I, one one quick one. Um, Can you just? <laughs> oh yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry. It's Chris. Yes, thank you. Uh, I would raise my hand next time. Uh, one quick no, no, one. No, don't raise your hand, but just show us that you're talking. <laughs> um, um, you know the. Social learning really jives with how I, if I re retroactively think of things I learned as an adult, it makes mm -hmm. perfect sense. Although, how do you feel like, I think in everything, there's also some direct experience with either nature or your body that you learn. We had a chat last time we were here about yoga and, uh, you mm -hmm. know, the online yoga communities, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Yoga with Adrian. And, uh, you know, but even that, even that when you're doing it on your own, you, you learn like, oh, this works good for back relief or this learns. And gardening is another thing where I learn very socially. But mm -hmm. sometimes I'll be, oh, tomatoes grow better in sunlight. Uh, and it's, you know, it, it, it's, it's a direct experience with, with nature or my body that, that teaches me something. Uh, right. And it's decontextualized from any social situation. How, does that figure into your thinking at all? Well, so... We're not trying to say that all learning is social, you know. We're saying we are fundamentally social human beings, you know. 
our identity as social and so but it doesn't mean that all cognitive processes are always social so you know if i go to a hotel i try to always remember where the right temperature is for the shower right so the next day i don't get burned right and so i'm learning something it's not it's not terribly meaningful it's not very transformative but it's useful and i remember until the next day or if i'm in a hotel for for a week i remember for that week and it's very useful so so yeah no there the, the are cognitive processes and you know you could argue that a shower is a social artifact sure but you know I, we're not making any claim here we're certainly not not making claims that behaviorism doesn't doesn't work or cognitivism doesn't work or, co or constructivism doesn't work you know we're we're just trying to develop a perspective that is coherent but like for instance the fact that it's a terrible idea to give an important lecture at 2 p.m or 2 30 p.m because the brain goes to sleep after lunch there's nothing in our theory to to say that you see what i mean you need to have a neurological learning theory to to make that claim so that's fine so so we're not saying that this is a complete learning theory is just a slice into a slice through the whole learning issue yeah we don't have a brain theory because they, they already exist you know they're already brain theories so you know why is it that the dog of a physicist does not become a physicist even though they go to, to with that, they are a service dog and they actually go to, with that physicist to all the meetings and sit in the office and everything but they never become a physicist because they have a different brain you know so we don't have our theory would predict by itself that the dog of a physicist would become a physicist if it's a service dog and it's there all the time but no to understand that you need to to combine our theory with a, a theory of the brain uh, so I don't, know, I don't know if that helps. I think in, in the social science, I think in the social sciences, actually I, I've written a little essay about that. In the social sciences, theories don't replace each other. They combine with each other. See, in the physical sciences, a better theory replace, replaces the former theory. But social learning theory does not replace cognitive theory. It needs to be what what in that essay I call plug and play. It needs to be to be to worked with it, you know. So uh, so I think that's a, that's a different in the social sciences is that is that uh, theories need theories in, in in the social sciences are more like pieces of a puzzle than a, a replacement of each other in a sort of tower uh, construction. I don't know. If this makes sense, but thank you. Anything else that came up in your in your breakout rooms? Yeah, go ahead, Aline. Hi. Um, something that we spoke about is how we, as as leaders in ed tech, we're all going to have unique experiences, and how important it is to share our experiences with one another so mm -hmm. that everyone can grow. Because like, if your, if your perception is based on experiences, yet you don't share with anyone, then you're doing a disservice to everyone you encounter because you're letting go of an opportunity where someone else can learn from your experiences. So we just, we spoke about the importance of sharing because we could take a situation or a problem that may not have a one size fits all solution and we can go ahead and expand that because we're looking at it through multiple lenses yeah i think that this is really beautiful yeah 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 and and, and what that means in some sense i think what you are saying is, is interesting also with respect to to uh, um, chris's point yeah in fact you don't cease to be a member of your community because you are not with the other members 
Because what you're saying is that you have an experience and you say, oh, I should remember to share this. So your community is with you, even when you are not with them uh, uh, physically, because you say, oh yeah, no, this is really interesting. Or if you have a question and you don't, you say, oh, I should ask that not next, time, next time we talk. Yeah. So that, that's interesting that the community is, is, is kind of sitting on your shoulders with you as you, um, as you go through life, yeah. Anything else? We talked about in our group. Yeah, yeah, Judith, okay. I see you. Yes, we talked about in our group, I was with Phil and Dana, um, the importance of, of how socialization is and finding other positive venues to socialize, especially, you know, for children, how important that is. And um, the healthy outlets. And Phil had shared that his daughter just watched a YouTube video and started knitting and learning ways because um, she being an only child, um, finding ways to entertain herself, mm -hmm. you know, when other folks are not around. And, and mm -hmm. we just kept talking about the importance of that. But the importance of, of engaging with like a YouTube video or the importance of also having other people around? Um, Both. Sure. The Both. importance of having other people around to socialize, as mm -hmm. well as when other people are not around, what right. you can do to still stay engaged. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now the internet has, has, has transformed, transformed that, transformed our access to, to, to competence and our access to practice in ways that, that are completely surprising. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Yeah. yeah. I have a son who, is, who takes singing lesson online. He's found a, a singing teacher who puts out videos. And so you enter the, you enter the, the, the house and you hear You say, what's going on? And he's on YouTube <laughs> practicing, practicing singing. It's really, really interesting. Anything else? Okay, so they give you a sense of how the theory morphed from a, a place where there was a, a clear master and a clear practice and a clear destination for learning to a place where the destination is created as we go in some sense. But um, more recently in the last few years, especially uh, 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 with my wife, Beverly, uh, we were kind of like thinking, yeah, but, it's, well, first of all, in, in our practice, in our work, uh, we were more and more asked to facilitate learning in groups where there was not a single practice, but there were multiple practices discussing something because most difficult problems are not amenable to solution by a single practice. And so more and more we were asked to facilitate groups. They didn't share a background. They didn't, they didn't share a practice really, but they shared the need for each other to address a, a, a problem that they, that they cared about. And so what we realized is that focusing on a single practice can be at the cost of the learning in the broader, what we call social landscape. And so we started to, we are now on, on uh, for those of you, sorry, I should always say that we are on slide number 12, uh, going to slide number 13, uh, starting to work on what we call phase three of the theory, uh, number 14. Uh, this is actually a a project that we were involved in at the University of Brighton. And the project was about child resiliency. And a professor at the university was bringing together academics, uh, practitioners in the, in the town, uh, who, were, who, who were social workers and psychologists, parents, and as the community evolved, they even decided to bring the kids themselves uh, 
who had challenges, a learning disability or, or a physical disability, uh, uh, and, and how to explore the idea of resilience across these different uh, uh, practices that could inform each other, but you know, the, the academics were not gonna become the practitioners and the practitioners were not gonna become the parents. Uh, and the parents were not going to become the kids. So it was not like they were learning to become the same thing. They were negotiating the boundaries between their practice so that their practice could be more effective at addressing the problem of, of children with, with, with challenges and, and uh, how, to, how to develop resilience for them. And so more and more, we, we, we saw that need of renegotiating the boundary between practices as a, as a form of learning, as a way to develop the learning capability of a, of a system. And this is where we started to move from focusing on single communities to focus on what we call a landscape of practice. And the landscape of practice looks something like, like what you have in, uh, in slide 15, you know, you have rivers and you have peaks and you have valleys and you have big hills and you have small hills. And for us, the idea of a landscape became a, a useful metaphor because if you think of a community of practice as a hill in the landscape, then the community of practice defines kind of the gradient of learning. This is, you need to climb that hill in order to, uh, to be a member, but there are also valleys and valleys are very interesting because valleys are places of boundary between two practices where the competence is not really defined. Uh, and you may have rivers that flow, where we have, we have flow across different practices. So, so the idea of a, of a landscape as a, as a living thing that, that's not, static but that moves uh, uh, became an interesting metaphor to start thinking about how do we enhance the learning capability of a, of a system. Um, and in that context, uh, yeah, engaging at boundaries became, became an important uh, uh, question, both theoretically, what does it mean to have different boundaries? And practically, how do you facilitate a conversation with people who come from very, very different places, who don't speak the same language? They, they may all speak English, but, but they, they're, they're, the jargon of their community is, is completely different and so on and so forth. But that complicated the theory a little bit. Uh, if you now move to slide uh, 16, because as a social learning theory, the notion of community of practice was very elegant because it's like, what counts as learning? Well, what counts as learning? Well, go ask the members of that community if this is learning. You see what I mean? So if you, if you say, oh, is, it, is, is this kid practicing the violin and making progress? But when you ask someone who is a good violinist, are they, are they making progress? So in that community, people know the difference between being a good violinist and being not so, not so good violinist, and people can tell you. So in, on those hills, the learning is very well defined, is that you increase your competence in that practice and this is what defines learning. But if you need now to engage across boundaries, across a big landscape of different practices, you're gonna have to develop a meaningful, uh, you, you're gonna have to develop, uh, somebody's in the way before. You're gonna have to develop a meaningful relationship with communities of practice where you yourself cannot claim membership where you yourself cannot claim competence. 
I remember uh, um, working with, with doctors and administrators in a hospital system. And they, were, they didn't want to become each other. But they needed to have enough understanding of each other's practice that their conversation was actually productive. And so we've added a new concept in the theory, which we call knowledgeability. And knowledgeability is really an orientation to the landscape that allows you to have some understanding of a variety of practices, how together they form a landscape, but you yourself may not have any competence in any of those practices, or maybe you have competence in one or two. And so now you can see that as you develop the theory to address different situation and different context, you need to, uh, you know, add new concepts that allow you to, to address these circumstances. So while in phase two, learning was very much defined as acquiring the competence of a community, in phase three, learning can be that, but it can also be developing a picture of, a, of the landscape so that you understand where what you do fit in the broader picture of things. But you can understand also that from a theory building perspective, the notion of competence in a committee of practice is very well defined. But the notion of knowledgeability is actually not very well defined. You know? Because, you know, if I say, oh, I'm knowledgeable about politics and I don't know who Donald Trump is, everybody will say, no, you're not really knowledgeable. But if I tell you, hmm, I don't know, I, I, I don't know the, the name of the finance minister in Portugal, some people will say, hey, wait a minute, you should know that. They have done some very good things in the European Union. Or some people say, no, of course, yeah, it's all right. You are knowledgeable about politics, even though, see what I mean? So what counts as being knowledgeable really depends on where you are in the landscape. And a claim to knowledgeability is much more up in the air than a claim to competence, where the competence is well-defined and those who are good, we know who it is who is good. I don't know if you can appreciate <laughs> what a monkey wrench that was and still is a little bit because we, we still don't know. We still don't have very good criteria in the theory for when knowledgeability works and when it doesn't. When a claim to knowledgeability functions and when it doesn't. And this is still something that requires work uh, in the theory today. But that's kind of like what we're struggling with in phase three is this, this broader perspective. And if you move now to, uh, um, to slide number 17, then if you think of identity, identity then is not a journey into a specific community, but is managing who we are across different, different practices, different contexts. So, Identity becomes a very complex uh, process of managing the person you are becoming across a complex landscape of different things. And of course, nowadays, with the internet, we have access to so many practices. I mean, it's incredible. You, know, you, can, you can see a, 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 an open heart surgery on television. You can... Um, you can watch Balinese dancers and you can say, oh, should I become that? Should I not become that? Is this interesting? Is this something I should try? Oh, no, maybe that's not on my trajectory. See what I mean? So managing who you are becoming in the world is actually a very, a very um, complex thing. Um, and I think when we think of our students, we need to understand that access to curriculum is becoming less and less problematic, but access 
to conversation about who am I, am I becoming are much more uh, problematic, you know? And I think from this perspective, from the perspective of this theory, a critique for us, a critique of schooling, is that there is way too much emphasis on transmitting a curriculum and way not enough emphasis on how you negotiate who you're becoming, you know? That would be, that would be a critique of schooling from our perspective. You know? A critique of schooling does not say it should not be school. Schooling is very important, you know? Schooling today is more important than it has ever been because learning is so important. There's so much to learn in the world today. But the real problem, my real problem as a learner is not access to information. I can, I can watch a TED talk, I can order a book on Amazon. I, I have access to so much. My question is, I only have 24 hours. I need to sleep about eight. You know, I need to eat a little bit. How do I invest my time in meaningful ways so that the person that I'm becoming is, is, is a contributor, you know? I think those, those are serious questions that, that we see our kids facing, but, but that kids today, you know, uh, uh, face very seriously. And, and, and so my challenge to educators is how do you create a context where people can actually engage with that question meaningfully, you know? Uh, and that's, that, to me, that would be a great contribution of education if we could develop approaches and practices that would help our kids, you know, learn to become who they are, <laughs> who they want to become, especially when the destination is not clear. You know? So, so that's, that's, that's phase three. So some of the concept we have in phase three, we have that in, in uh, slide 18. Uh, so this notion of boundary. So boundary between communities become as important for learning as the communities themselves. And managing the boundaries, of course, uh, among communities become as important to develop learning capability as having deep communities that, that develop deep, deep competence. Uh, very important, this notion of knowledgeability. What we have interacted with people and we were supporting in our practical work, in our consulting work, people that we call systems convening. They are not community leaders because they don't lead any specific communities. But they bring people together for new conversation that would not happen was it not for their intervention in that landscape. And these are, these are really interesting people. Uh, actually, the other day we were talking to this amazing woman who she's a lawyer from San Francisco, but she lives in, in Geneva right now. And she, she is working on, on justice, you know, and she's bringing governments and NGOs and lawyers and police together to think, how do we, how do we go beyond torture? How do, and she, she lives, she works in, 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 and for us, she was like, like such an example of somebody who, who realized the complexity of the problem and says, we need to have the voice of the different stakeholders in that problem if we're going to make any progress. Yeah. So very, very amazing work that we see some people do, very humbling to see, because it's very complex, you know? To lead one community is difficult, but at least everybody kind of recognize each other, you know? But, you know, she works with some NGOs and she says, oh, we need to talk to the Minister of Justice. The Minister of Justice, that's the devil, that's evil, you know? We don't want to talk to them because they are the source of the problem. And she says, well, but if you don't talk to the source of the problem, how? How in the world are you going to solve the problem? So it's, you know, sometimes when you bring people across boundaries, it's not like, it's not like necessarily conflict free. <laughs> so, uh, very interesting. And uh, the last thing I wanted to mention in passing, and we can, I can go into depth a bit more if, if you want to, um, after we take a little break, but 
this notion that identity, when you talk about the landscape, identity and the process of identification requires more complex set of ways of relating to the world. We call them modes of identification. And one of them is what we are doing now. We are engaging with each other. So that's what we would call engagement. When people really engage with each other, have a conversation, negotiate something. But imagination is also very important. Imagination, not in the sense of fantasy, but imagination in the sense of like, yeah, thinking about another practice and having some image of what that practice does, you know? So constructing an image of the world. You can never engage with, all, with everybody, but you can still construct an image of the world uh, um, that allows you to, to define your identity, you know? I always say, if you fly over Switzerland, that's where I was born, if you fly over Switzerland, Switzerland doesn't exist. You don't see it, you know? But for Swiss people, their identity is very tied to the fact that this is a boundary with France, and I'm not French, I can tell you that. You know what I mean? So, it's not like Swiss, Swiss people engage with each other all the time, but they have this imagination that, oh, we're all Swiss, you know? Uh, so, imagination is a very important way of building an identity. And then alignment, you know, if you are an environmentalist, then for you to align your behavior with broader goals and broader, you may never engage with other people who recycle, but you recycle and you know they recycle. And because there's alignment there, there's a chance of having, of having uh, uh, effect at scale. So these, these different processes work, work with each other to create a relationship uh, uh, with the world. And therefore an identity for us. So, what I propose is to go into breakout rooms now to develop some questions because what I've, what I've presented in the last 15 minutes is, is actually fairly complex. So, negotiate some questions with each other. We're going to give, let's say, 15 minutes. How about that? And you can take a, you take a break also. You can take a break first and then come back or discuss first and then take your break or take the break in the middle, whatever. Uh, Laura, what do you think? Is 15 minutes enough for people to... I think so. I think that's perfect. Five minutes for discussion and another 10 minutes for break or however they'd like yeah. to negotiate it. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. Very good. So I'm going to send you into, in, into your breakout rooms. You discuss a little bit, take a break. You self-organize and we'll be back in, a, in 15 minutes. Okay. 1135 so. everyone, 1135. Our time. Okay, yeah, that's 11, sorry, yeah. I guess when people take a break, it's more difficult to bring them back. <laughs> then we, they are just in the breakout room and just yank them back. You can break us apart easier virtually, but it's hard to bring us all back. So. Oh. Looks like some people are still on break, huh? I 
I think they're all coming in now. Oh, good, good. So should we start? Okay, very good. So let's let's have a, a, a little conversation because what I want to do next is really go into where we think this is going now. Um, and so I think that it would be good to to have what I just talked about kind of solid. Uh, so if there is anything that doesn't seem clear, if there is any insight that you have, question that your group came up with, uh, now is the time. Uh, here. Yeah, go ahead. Can uh, so, uh, yes. How you doing? Hi. Uh, so we kind of mentioned it real quick. We were talking about how can we bring all these concepts into like a K to 12 approach, like for elementary, middle school. And the discussion kind of went into how at that level, we might just be teaching them how to maneuver the roads mm. of, of learning so they can try to see where they fall within their own learning community. Mm -hmm. Because eventually they'll try, they'll have to figure that out on their own. So it's kind of interesting how I really like how you relate this community as maybe having its own hill and how to be at the top of your community or to be engaged in your community, you have to actually climb it. Mm -hmm. And as educators, we might have to like pass on the knowledge, how to climb, how to drive the roads, how to maneuver around it and be, you know, helpful to your own community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, I would like to hear what people have to say because I, I guess I'm not I'm not a K to twelve teacher myself, so I have no idea. I've I've had some th I've had three kids, uh, but I have no idea how to be a, a good K to twelve teacher. So uh, uh, I would like to hear what people have to say because it's, it's actually very difficult, you know, because because in some sense, as a teacher, you are kind of locked into a system that was organized with a different learning theory, you know, that was organized with a theory that knowledge can be, can be reified into a curriculum, that curriculum can be transmitted into people's head, and then what they do with it is their problem, as long as I, they can pass the exam. And so, yeah, go ahead. I, I just wanted to, uh, hi, my name is Damiano. Um, I just wanted to throw out there that as you're describing the way that our system is built for K through 12, part of the things that we need to do is move away from the idea that there is one person that knows everything and transitions to a way where we design with and not for our students. And so mm -hmm. uh, for, the, for our K through 12 educators in the room, perhaps one of the things we need to do as teachers is acknowledge the fact that we are not the master of this, this model. We are part of the learning system. And so the way that we do it at my school is that students are encouraged and engaged in uh, building agency to give themselves their own level of social autonomy to say, 
I would like to learn this way. I would like to do it because this is what works for me. And so by building that type of normative practice within your school culture may enable you to start uh, gathering up some type of uh, methodology or direction for building a community of practice. So that way they can start using those um, strategies and abilities instead of encountering it for the first time in the adult learning place. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's really important. And actually, we, in, in our new book, we really talk a lot about agency as, as a key to learning. And the problem, the problem, if you are just curriculum focused and transmission focused, is that agency does not really matter. The agency of the students doesn't really matter because as long as the curriculum has been transmitted and you can use a test to make sure that it has made it into that head, agency does not really matter. But in fact, agency is super, super important we would even say that what you learn with agency, if you learn something with agency and you learn the same thing without agency, you are not learning the same thing. You know, you're not learning the same thing. And so- and as part of the community, you know, for those of you that are uncomfortable with agency building or figuring out how to do that, of course, we will wait in anticipation for this book, but when COVID <laughs> is also over, I will, I'm happy to invite all of you to meet our young people and hear from them of how agency has played into their learning journey. Um, and that goes to all 51 people in this chat. Mm, fantastic, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because it, how to do it practically, I think is, is, is really important because in certain ways, the system was designed to remove agency, to remove agency from the students, but sometimes even to remove agency from the teachers by specifying completely what they have to do and, 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 and remove it. So, so I, I, if, if you have ways to, to do that, I think that's, that's, really, that's really wonderful um, and, and, and profound, profound, yeah. So where is the balance between ensuring students gain certain proficiencies or standards uh, uh, yet at the same time, ensuring that there's sufficient agency for all learners to be uh, 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 truly vested uh, uh, in what they're doing. I mean, that, that's gotta be the, 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 the big question. Yeah, I mean, I think there are certain standards that we have to, to, to really uh, uh, impose on everybody, I, I agree. But I think uh, schools of education should have a program to say, okay, What's the minimum standard that we have to impose on everybody, whether they, whether they have agency with it or not? Like learning how to read is probably something that should not involve choice, right? Learning how to count to 12, probably also maybe 15 or something like that. I'm, I'm just kidding, but, <laughs> but you know, the problem is that the curriculum is often devised by members of this community who think that what they're doing is very important. Uh, and so um, it would be interesting to, I wonder if, if we put 100 teachers in a room for three days and they had to negotiate, what is it that every child needs to know? And the rest they can explore. It would be interesting. I don't know. I don't know if this hundred teachers would end up agreeing. Uh, to me, that's a, that's an interesting question. You know? I think everybody would agree that in the twenty first century, you have to learn. You have to know how to read. You have to know how to write or at least type. I don't know if you need, still need to learn cursive. But certainly, write by some means, right? Uh, some basic numeracy. I'm not sure exactly where, I'm not sure what, what everybody needs to know on, on numeracy. Maybe some basic history, you know, but, you know, I don't know. It, it would be interesting to, 
to and even those things. I think there are different ways of 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 teaching them. I think, for instance, one thing that our theory, a question that our theory is is uh, would be would be asking educators is what is the effect on a person's identity to spend many, many years being told that what counts as knowledge is produced by communities to which they do not belong. That's an interesting educational question, you know? And it's even worse if if you are of a gender or of a, a, a skin color that is not very well represented in, in this knowledge producing communities. So, but I think it's, it's true for everybody, but even worse for, uh, for people who don't see themselves. And so I think the question of agency for me is so important, but it's also the case that kids do not have many interactions with those knowledge producing people, you know? So I think part of the agency would be to I see like- get, it, Well, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead, yeah. I, I just wonder how we get administrator buy-in to giving us more time to, to teach students how to find their identities. And, and I know at our school, we have a character ed program, but they're um, trying to pigeonhole the students into learning specific skills, like be an honest person, be a trustworthy person. And they're kind of telling them what to do as opposed mm -hmm. to letting them discover it for themselves. And I wonder if like maybe a good place for this would be a social studies curriculum where you can kind of tie in the exploration or discovery of oneself mm -hmm. learning uh, the historical background. But I still think we would need admin support to allow us to give that time to build it into the uh, curriculum. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I don't know myself, you see, <laughs> because for me, <laughs> I'm, I'm a learning theorist and I'm not an administrator in a system where there are all sorts of systems of accountability that may or may not represent the things that we really want kids to um, to develop. So, so I, I completely agree with you that because because also education is a very complicated system because everybody has their opinion, you know. So, so for me, my hope before I die is that some new vocabulary about, about learning makes it into the public discourse, you know? And, and that happens, you know, sometimes. I mean, we don't realize, but the word democracy was no way. It, it, it took a lot of work to bring the, the idea of democracy into concrete institutions and, you know what I mean? So- Can I add something? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. I just feel like, as the years go on in the education field, they're trying to add more socialism into the curriculum. And even if it's not like based on a certain subject, I feel like they try to add it more like during morning time. So now they're doing like morning circles or um, uh, character ed circles, or they even do it like, we have like the counselor sometimes coming to the classroom and talk about the importance of socializing and friendship through mm -hmm. read alouds and um, activities. Mm -hmm. So I think that, um, even if it's not directly into the curriculum, they're trying to embed it somehow so that students can see the importance of socialism and grouping and even like the counselors, if they don't come into the classroom, if they see students having difficulty um, being bullied or having trouble making friends or just being social in general, mm -hmm. um, they pull them out and they do like a small group of friendships. So what is friendship? What is being social mean? What does this mean? Mm -hmm. So. I think as it get as we grow, we learn more and more. We're not where we need to be, but I think it's a at least a little positive note that we can say that we have. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I agree with you. I think I think it's it's definitely shifting. I can I can I can feel that even though I'm not in the system, I can I can feel. But sometimes it's very difficult to institutionalize things. 
if you don't have a good vocabulary for for what it means, you know. And and I think as somebody as uh, our friend here, Michelle was saying, it, it can be easily pigeonholed into 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 one thing, you know. But when it comes to history, no, your your, ident your identity and your uh, uh, your agency don't count because you're not a historian. And so, yeah, I, I mean, I don't have a solution, but I'm starting to see what are the fundamental questions that we would need to ask. And I'm a little worried sometimes when I go work to, uh, with schools of education is that they are more addressing how to teach the, the triangle, equilateral triangle, than how to, how to think about how do we, how do we create? Because I think the reason agency is so important is that the people nowadays who are um, high contributors, and I, I've met amazing people, you know, but they are not like passive, you know, they are not like compliant people. They are passionate, they are <laughs> engaged. They are, they use their own identity as a, as a wellspring of ideas to do something that, about something they care about, you know. I remember my son, maybe I told you that like two years ago because it was so striking. My son told me, he said, the problem with high school, he was going to high school in California, the problem with high school is that, for, is that you can't be interested in anything because if you get too interested in something, then you lose your footing in the other things and you can't go to college. So, so I think, wow, have we really created an institution where for four years at the most formative time in the identity creation, our adolescents are not allowed to be passionate about anything? That doesn't seem to be, that seems to be a, a, a bit misplaced, you know? And, you know, again, I mean, uh, as, as uh, Joshua was saying, there are certain standards, you know? But do we really have to fill the time with those standards in such a way that there is no place for, for people to, to be passionate about something? I don't know. The, to, to me, those are really the interesting, the interesting questions. You know? uh, here, Giancarlo. May, uh, for me, it's actually kind of interesting to see how that compares the at least educational system in, in the United States here. and where you were saying the focus on those four years of high school being so formative and for him to have to spread amongst all the subjects where education mm -hmm. system and somewhere else, for example, Spain, mm -hmm. you study until what, what is it, the ninth grade? And then you decide whether you go to these academies, whether the science academy or the English academy for the next mm -hmm. few years before you go to university, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, would that kind of be related to the students deciding at an early age what path they're taking? But then it's also hard for them to decide, okay, I went to the science academy, but I don't want to be a scientist anymore. How hard is it for them to now retract and go to a different academy before right. they go to uni? Yeah, yeah. Actually, actually for me, I, I like the American system where you don't declare your major until two years into college. I think in Europe, you have to declare your major be, even before you go to university. And sometimes by choosing an academy, uh, for me, I, uh, it was... It was at age 15 that you chose whether you want to go into classics or science. And I think, I think that's, what, what I'm talking about is not choosing a career. Uh, I think, well, I think most people will have many careers in the context of, the, of their lifetime. So yeah, I, I think we should see that these choices don't have, we should make sure these choices don't have lifetime consequences because even my choices, I'm, I'm 60, 68 years old, I'm, I'm still making all sorts of wrong decisions. So, <laughs> but, but like for instance, to, to become good at something, I think that would be important, you know. It's almost more important to become good at something than what that something is, you see what I mean? For me, I went through high school in Switzerland, I never had to be really good at anything. I was never pushed. I was a good student generally. I had good grades, but I was never pushed. You know, it's only, 
in my adult life that I realized, wow, if you want to write a book, you're going to have to go through the tunnel of thinking this chapter is not going to come together. This chapter is a piece of shit. I'm not, there is no end, at the, there's no light at the end of this tunnel. But I have to keep going because the choice is not to go back. I have to keep going, but I don't know if there is a light at the end of this tunnel. I, di I didn't know that to achieve something, you had to go through that dark side, you know? Can but I it's important. You go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Uh, as a bilingual teacher, I face the identity loss with my students all the time, especially when they newly come to the school system. So they, they don't recognize um, their identities compared to everything they face in the new society. So the problem in the schools, I, I will talk specifically um, about my school, they don't get themselves well they don't understand like um there is no system or no curriculum that enhances their identities or um help them to understand their uh beings like like if they i mean uh to to form their future or to form their conceptual about them their themselves or something so Mm -hmm. that we, like we neglect that we are in um, a diverse society, society that fill of a lot of different identities. So, mm -hmm. yeah, there you are talking about people who are in transition, which is even more difficult. Yeah. Um, something else. Oh. Can go. You go or me. Can I, can I say something? Hello, can you hear me? Uh, huh? Is it Seda? Yes, Seda, yes. Uh -huh. yeah, 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 go ahead, go ahead. Uh, hey, 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 Dr. Ichen, yes. Yeah, actually, I have a question that is coming into my mind. I want to know how can social learning theory uh, help, you know, for some type of a reform in education, you know? And I want to know how can we test that theory? And uh, actually, I think you are transforming, you know, learning and uh, it's gonna be a book, right? Like your, your theory is gonna be a book and that we, I hope, it will actually help uh, to inspire like some of uh, educational reform. And when actually I'm uh, listening to you, I'm thinking about the book written uh, by Jean-Jacques Rousseau, you know Jean-Jacques Rousseau, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, who wrote a book, The Contrat Social. Mm -hmm. uh, in French we say, uh, so, uh, contract social or social contract, right? Mm -hmm. And that book definitely in the 70s helps and to inspire some type of like a political reforms and a revolution in the, in the Europe, especially in the France in mm -hmm. the 70s. And I can tell you, know, I'm seeing actually your book, eh, so something like a, a contrat social written by Jean-Jacques Rousseau in <laughs> 17, that will help eh, to inspire some reforms and uh, some revolution eh, in education, not only in the United States, but eh, somewhere else, and taking into account the social aspect eh, in education, which is very important. Mm -hmm. Me too, you know, like I, I used to live in Africa, Africa, I went to Europe, Europe, I mean, and mm -hmm. I can tell, you know, even like the barrier language, some social aspect you have to take into account, and you know, that, that, that sounds uh, good. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's very, that's very much our hope, <laughs> uh, is that because, you know, not being educators ourselves, we cannot tell people what to do, but we can we can give the perspective, you know. That's what theory does. It, it, theory doesn't tell you what to do. Theory is more like a, a set of lenses that allow you to, to, see, to see the problem in a certain way. And, um, and as I said, we're, we're not even saying that all problems have to be looked through the lens of social learning theory. We're just saying that it's a, it's a dimension that has been neglected. Um, 
in part because because we have a we have a theory of knowledge that is very much focused on knowledge as stuff um, as opposed to knowing as a way of being in the world um, and so that's 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 where we're trying to to push back a bit you know um, If I just may add something as far as the way our curriculum is structured mm -hmm. and anybody that's on here that teaches social studies can probably speak to this, but it's our job as educators, even looking at the curriculum as it stands, even in New Jersey, since that's where the majority of, of us are right now, but the disciplinary concepts just for civics and government alone actually say that we are supposed to teach um, how students are supposed to become productive members in their communities. That's even before second grade. And then every, you know, the strands go, the next step up is how they contribute as a whole to the democracy in the country. Mm. And then it gets bigger by the end of eighth grade where they're supposed to understand the, how we're supposed to be committed to civility and compromise to your point of negotiation. Mm -hmm. And by mm -hmm. high school, it's really, understanding how we all have an identity and a value and mm -hmm. it's completely different from one place to another so mm -hmm. somehow some way we've lost our way even with the basics of what the standards tell us because by the time curriculum may be written it's written completely different in every one of our towns or our districts mm -hmm. so it's it's like the identity and the community building that we're supposed to be teaching is getting mm -hmm. lost or watered down by other things. Interesting. And do you know why that's the case? Uh, well, there's a lot of reasons why. <laughs> uh, and that could get political, but it could also be that, um, and I'm speaking, you know, I was a, a, an elementary teacher, but I'm speaking as an administrator. Mm -hmm. If you don't support your teachers and you don't give them curriculum, and the curriculum is not revised and updated by the teachers because they're mm -hmm. the experts, then mm -hmm. those things get lost. So if you don't mm -hmm. have updated and revised curriculum that aligns to the standards that you're supposed to be teaching, you're doing a disservice to kids. Mm -hmm. Bev? Sorry. <laughs> um, yes. So, for me, I, I don't know the practicality of, of how to do what, you, what you're saying. Uh, um, but if you don't have a good language, maybe the standards do, pro, do pro, provide a good language to start thinking about how we engage uh, our students in a in a real way of seeing learning as 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 becoming a person, not just seeing. But, but for many people, learning is just acquiring acquiring stuff, acquiring certainties, uh, rather than engaging with the unknown. Uh, and that's. I think we, we still have very much, uh, uh, in, in a minute, we, we, we'll, we'll go more into that, but it's amazing how much people think that learning is the transmission of certainty from one person who knows to a person who doesn't. And that's, that's an overwhelming image that people have. It's interesting because working, working with a lot of expert practitioners in our own work, what we have noticed is that people who are really good at the job at very difficult jobs. They are not people who live in certainty, you know, but they are people who are very productive under conditions of uncertainty. And I think 
that's a different way of thinking about expertise, of thinking about, about knowledge. Yeah. And I think you know that as a teacher. If you're a good teacher, it's not because you know everything about your students and you're certain about everything. It's just that you can engage in a conversation with the class in a way that is productive, you know, and you have a certain ideas of where it should be going, but, but it is a process of negotiating a path, you know. So, so this idea that knowledge equals certainty is, is, actually, is actually not correct. I mean, it's true for certain factual knowledge. I'm not saying that, I, you know, science has been very good at producing cer some certainty about certain facts. And I'm grateful for that, it's great. But it's only one very specific minuscule form of knowledge all the factual knowledge. Anything else that came up in your conversation? Uh, something my group talked about. Yeah. Um, hi. Um, you talked about possibly like bringing mentoring maybe at an earlier, you know, stage in the school system. Uh, maybe having the high school kids mentor middle school, the middle school mentor the, you know, early, you know, earlier children and then, you know, mm -hmm. just kind of vice versa so they can, you know, maybe find themselves through, you know, the experiences of others or, you know, get feedback or, you know, begin at a younger age, you know, to, you know, just establish those connections. Um, mm -hmm. Might help someone find their, you know, find themselves as well. So, so is, it, is, this, is this something that has been tried? Or... I mean, I think I would, it would be a great idea to, you know, maybe more establish it, especially nowadays, because, you know, kids aren't really seeing other kids or maybe like bringing it into the curriculum somehow, even, you know, more than it has been in the past. Mm -hmm. My uh, grammar school had like a mentorship type program uh, where eighth graders were given a fourth grader to as a little buddy and we showed them how that was my uh, school system, four to eight. It was a gift and talent in school. So we had to show them essentially the ropes of the school and how to mm -hmm. become a better student. And how did, it, how did that work? It worked really well. My, uh, my little buddy just graduated uh, his master's <laughs> a couple <laughs> days ago. <laughs> I work in the district that Michael's referring to and we still have programs like that now in addition to um, uh, peer mediation and peer leadership, mm -hmm. helping kids with a lot of social and emotional adjustment. But we're, um, our schools are set up where it's um, kindergarten or pre-K now through grade eight. So it's all the same, or all these vast ages in one building. So to kind of um, give more responsibility and some good training to the older kids, mm -hmm. instead of just letting them do what it is that they do in their own school, Mm -hmm. and the mentoring has been very positive with the younger kids and it's fostered a nice relationship within the buildings. Mm. Wow, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. And does it happen also in the context that Sally was, was talking about where students come from our recent immigrants and, and need, need help integrating into a, a whole new context? In one of our schools, um, we have one school that focuses on welcoming bilingual students. Mm -hmm. I had the pleasure of working there for a year. And kids are coming at all different times of the year. There's just no rhyme or reason based on what their families need when they migrate. And mm -hmm. it's, it's amazing how there's such a change. Some come in not knowing a word of English. And within a few months to a year, they're, they're moving through the program and going into mainstream education, which is mm -hmm. fantastic. But we do have mentorship set up for those students as well. Um, not just from the adults that are the translators and the people to support, but also within the school, kids that are English speakers are buddied up, and it, it really makes a big difference. It makes the world a little smaller for that moment. I just need to, ask, to add something to what I said before. Um, sometimes it has a, a very negative impact of uh, this isolation because parents, as a result, they are isolated from uh, the schools as well so they start to come up with ideas that 
are not exist. So they start to be more aggressive uh, towards the school, more aggressive towards the teachers. They don't accept uh, easily any of the instructions or learning. They, they question everything in the curriculum in a different way, just like the, um, uh, I don't, I don't remember exactly the, the, um, the new curriculum that should be uh, like apply in like it's LG something. It's about, um, I'm sorry. LGBTQ. I'm sorry. LGBTQ. Yes. Plus. Yes. Because they don't really know what's in it. So they start to question everything. They start to even demonstrate in some ways. So. Yeah. Yeah, the broader context is, is actually difficult. The polarization that we experience in the US is actually is making it difficult, I think, for teachers to be to be really themselves and engaged. I'm sure that it, I'm sure that it's difficult. Um, hello. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we've been talking a lot about this one issue, but you did cover a lot of different issues as well. Yeah. That time. And um, just as far as this issue is concerned, as somebody who is involved in, in something right now that's kind of new, um, I, it just appears to me that this is the next wave that's coming into education, the social and emotional learning um, pedagogy that needs to you know, um, we need the professional development in our schools. I know in my district, um, uh, there's a lot of outreach going out to kids. Um, and, I, and I see that your work and other people's work is affecting the school system. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just going to take time. But I think that like, like a lot of things, when people see the opportunity in, the, in it, not just from a, a social point of view, but also, you know, as a potential for employment or something like that, it, it might get popular. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about was the bandwidth issue you brought up because I think it's very important. And I find that like um, this, you know, um, this program and programs like it and what you guys are trying to do for us is for us to kind of target our thoughts because there are like macro and micro issues, but um, if we can help fix one component, um, then we can, maybe be more impactful and that requires us to really be conscious of our bandwidth you mean your bandwidth as as a teacher or as a human being or you or the students as a bandwidth? human being as a human being yeah. because like you know um i find myself for example um the elephant in the room is the zoom right now for me because like you know, it's a lot to ask for a human to to sit in front of a screen mm -hmm. and stare at people he just met for eight hours a day, you know, mm -hmm. um, when there's no opportunity for disengagement too, mm -hmm. um, no opportunity for mental retreat because there's different kind of leaders. Everybody here is a leader. And there's some people that, you know, want to or just naturally inclined, like idea people who come in and like, you know, br you know, but then they, there's that time when, you know, if we were actually physically together, um, there'd be other things going on. And so the challenge I think we're all facing is how do we um, infuse those um, opportunities for disengagement, like a chat room or this and that, but also be considered of the other things that make us human in a virtual environment at this time. Yeah, yeah. No, that's, that's for sure. And actually, we, we are just getting ready to, st to start a workshop, a, a four-week workshop uh, next week. And we're just setting the space. And uh, yeah, that, we are trying to, to have to give every... We are using Mural. I don't know if you know what Mural is, but it's a kind of... Uh, it's a big... Well, there's, an there's an inherent irony in the fact that we're speaking about something that we don't practice. And I feel like that's, you know, since my undergrad since my graduate and now here it's 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 paralleled you know 
And I think what keeps us going is our, is our passion and our good intention. But, you know, it's just difficult to address flaws when we practice them. Well, well, I mean, we, 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 can seek, we can seek ways to practice that, even if we not, cannot be uh, face to face. And that's what we're trying to do in that workshop I was telling you, it's an online workshop. And so we're trying to, to create spaces where people can be themselves, can, can express who they are, bring pictures of their kids, and, but also interact in, in ways that are different from when we're on Zoom. And, and we, so we try to find different spaces of interaction. And I think that's, uh, that's an art we need to learn. Um, and yeah, we're exploring in different a, ways. There has to be a sort of desaturation, you know, because what happens is I've been on Zoom since it feels like, you know, uh, March 13th. And so there's, <laughs> it's been quite a challenge, you know, and yeah. um, this week, it's funny, but it just, just felt, I just started to feel what I think people are calling Zoom fatigue and what, you know, I think of as zoom -athons. And I just don't see parallels in real human interaction that you can compare that level of saturation to. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, so it's unfortunate that I come, that I, I do this on Friday, actually, because <laughs> I come when you are all uh, uh, ready to drop dead for the weekend. Uh, but, but anyway, let's, let's start, uh, try to continue this. So uh, anything else about phase one, two, three, because I would like to, at some, uh, uh, in a few minutes that we have left, to give you a sense of where we are going with phase four. Uh, so, okay. anything yeah, else? Could you tell yeah. us what slide we should be on, please? Oh, we're not on the slide yet. I'll, I'll tell okay. you, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, Good yeah. question. But I think we should take a, a five minute break before we, we jump into that, because people say you should not look at the screen for more than 45 minutes without just jumping up. So when I, when, I say, when I say five minutes, it's really four minutes to go grab a cup of tea, go to the bathroom and come back, okay? Um, I'm gonna skip around a little bit rather than go through the whole presentation. Um, so I'll just let you know uh, which slide you should be on, but you should be on slide 19 at the moment. Oh, sorry, I forgot to put my, I don't know if you heard what I said. So what I said, you, 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 you were hear, hearing me? Okay, good, because I forgot to put this on. Um, so, I think, I think for us, our work is, is as I said, is, is now entering a new phase in the sense that if we look at the landscape of practice with all the kind of interactions that are going on, really a committee of practice, which up to now has been really kind of like the foundation of the theory, is only one type of social learning context or container uh, that exists. And so we kind of went back and started to think maybe there is something more fundamental than the community of practice and the community of practice is, a, is an extension of that because people were using the term community of practice for two, for two purposes. One was like, you know, the practice of orthopedists or something, like a long history of learning in a certain domain that creates a regime of competence by which people recognize each other as competent members. But some people were using the term community of practice to refer more to a certain way of engaging with each other, a kind of peer-to-peer -peer learning process. You know, like you would go to a, to a conference and you, on the conference program, there's 
And from four to five, we'll have a community of practice in the, in the coffee room or something. And that was not really the right use of the term, but we could see what they, want, what they meant. They meant that at that time, there won't be a presentation with an expert. It will be more like we engage with each other and try to figure things out together. And so we decided to split those two uses of the term to keep the term community of practice for a history of learning that over time has given rise to a practice, has given rise to a certain form of competence that people can recognize in each other. That's what we want to keep the term community of practice for. But for the kind of engagement, moment of engagement that, um, that they were talking about in that conference, we, want, we wanted to use a different term. And the term that we have chosen to use for that is what we call a social learning space. And so for us, a social learning space is a social space where people act as learning partners. And if you now move to slide 21, I'm gonna jump around a little bit. If you, uh, because we, we, we said, well, we have some characteristic of a community of practice. So what would the kind of theoretical characteristics of a social learning space be? Yeah. And the first, the first one uh, that, we, that we thought was important is that people are there because they care to make a difference. So in a social learning space, you are there because you are driven by something that you care about. The second characteristic of what we call a social learning space is that you engage your uncertainty in that space. You want to make a difference, but you have some uncertainties about how to make that difference or even whether that difference is worth making. That's what you, what you give to the social space. And then, last thing, you really pay attention to what that engagement of uncertainty does. How the world responds to you engaging your uncertainty. So far, those are the three characteristics. They are the characteristics that we define in that book that I was telling you about that is coming out in September. As a kind of funda fundamental unit of social learning theory. Now, some of those social learning space, spaces may evolve into communities of practice over time. So the two concepts are still very related but you can have a fantastic conversation on a train with someone that you're never gonna see again. But for that moment, it had that characteristic of like both engaging, trying to, to deepen your understanding of something that you care about because it, it allows you to make a difference to yourself or to the world. So it's, you don't want to call, call this a community of practice. You're never going to see that person again. But that moment, and it's not saying that all conversations are, 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 are social learning spaces. There are lots of, of conversations that are just chit chat or they're just information transmission, you know. But these moments where there's a certain magic of like recognizing each other as partners in uncertainty, trying to struggle together to go a little further, make a little progress. And for us, we think, <laughs> we think that we've made progress in our theory by articulating that element. We think that, yeah, it's like the, it's like, it's like the cell to biology. You know, a cell in biology is the, is the smallest possible unit that has all the characteristics of life. Right? And, and so we think we have kind of articulating the, the fundamental unit of 
of social learning theory with those three things. Um, and it's, 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 it, it seems like, oh yeah, no, of course, yeah, you know, that makes a total sense. It's actually complex, you know? Caring to make a difference, you know? Many people don't really think they can make a difference, you know? We work a lot with, um, we work a lot with people who do work in, in international development. And, you know, sometimes the first thing that you need to convince people before you go anywhere is that hey, you, you can make a difference because for them, they have given up. Yeah. And actually also in, in very large bureaucracies, sometimes people don't think that they can make a difference. So this idea of igniting, igniting a feeling that you can make a difference if you know how, and it's worth learning how, is, is complex, you know? and political in certain ways, you know? but also engaging uncertainty. <laughs> I'm, I'm lucky enough to, to do this work with my wife, and, and she told me something that I had never, I had never known. She said, you don't realize that at the end because you don't experience it. But if you're a woman, if you're a man and you show uncertainty, people say, oh, he's so humble. But if you're a woman and you show uncertainty, people think oh, she's not very competent. Very true. No, as a man, I had, never, I had never noticed that. I didn't know that. But it was, it was very, I realized that engaging uncertainty is, not, is, is much more problematic as a way of being in the world than just um, just like, oh yeah, I'm here to learn or something. Yeah. Can I add something? Yeah, yeah, go on. Just to piggyback off of you. I feel like, you know, like you were saying, like it's an ignition inside of a person to feel it. And it comes from the other way too, like the person sitting across from you, like the child or an adult, they know if you really want to be there, you, they can feel it also. So if you have it in them, you're going to give it to them and they're going to start feeling it also. It's kind of like a effect, right? Like mm -hmm. a downfall effect, I feel like. And uh, the more someone smiles, the more you give, the more the other person feels it. So kind of like a vibe. And yeah. I totally agree with everything you're saying. Yes. And so now, um, we are not saying, for instance, that all classrooms interactions should be social learning spaces, you know? But we, it's still a question of when and under what circumstances is this a useful way of thinking of the relationship between people in a, in a room. See what I mean? Like, it's, like, it's almost like a question, social learning space is more a question than an answer. You know, it's like, you know, you have this family dinner, Thanksgiving dinner, and it's like, is this worth trying to make this a social learning space or not? You know? It's, it's more like, is this useful? Is this a useful moment for that kind of human, profoundly human interaction of, of thinking of each other as learning partners uh, uh, for something that, that, that you care about? And even paying attention, actually, paying attention also has, has is, is, is actually not, is actually not unproblematic because paying attention often Paying attention requires as much unlearning as learning. You see what I mean? Because all your own ideas can prevent you from paying attention to, to, what's, to what's really happening. And actually, one of the way that power can come in the way of social learning is that people in positions of power have less need to pay attention. I think as parents and teachers, sometimes um, we're guilty of that, you know, not being able to pay attention, um, either because the stresses of life, you know, get in the way, you have to work, you have to pay bills, you have to cook dinner by six o'clock, 
and your children are talking to you and and that happens to me a lot i'm i'm guilty of it and <laughs> my children say mommy are you paying attention and i say yes but in truth i'm not really paying attention <laughs> so i lose the importance you know i lose that moment and you know and that moment is gone cuz you know mm -hmm. at that point they really needed me to listen at that mm -hmm. point. So as teachers as well, the same thing, you know, mm -hmm. we're so busy getting the curriculum together. We're so busy making sure we stay with our routine because we don't want to get in trouble. Uh, but yet Johnny's saying to you, teacher, teacher, can you listen to my idea? But there's so much going on, you know, that again, you miss those moments. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And actually we don't, we don't, we don't, use this concept to judge people you see what i mean <laughs> it's more to have a to have a view of learning that's different from the transmission of certainty you know to to say that there there are important learning moments where a learning partnership is formed that does create a kind of magic you know and of course it's not always possible you know we are all human and sometimes there is too much stress and there is too much cooking and the uh, rice is burning and, you know. The term synergy comes to mind, sir. You know, like uh -huh. a syn you know. and when you um, remove the, the objective sometimes, you know, the, the deadline um, and, and the, the task orientation, mm -hmm. um, you, you provide an atmosphere for creativity in which, um, you know, you never know, like it could actually produce a better product than just worrying about getting the job done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and that's why we wanted to give it a special name, the name that's different from a community of practice or a team or something like this. It's a, it's a, now a team can also create a social learning space. Maybe sometimes when they reflect, they are, they finish the task and they reflect and they, so a team can, be, can create a social learning space. A classroom can become a social learning space. A conference can become a social learning space, although that's often more in the hallway and at the coffee break than during, during the presentations. Uh, there are all sorts of, of, of ways that different, as I was saying, a, a conversation can become a social learning space. But, but we're saying that it's important to have a concept that will allow us to recognize the preciousness of this of these moments um, and to have a sense of what we can do to to, to make it happen so i just wanted to i know when we come back to school in september there there is going to be a huge sense of uncertainty particularly um, when it comes to teaching online for many teachers in our district we had what we call professional learning communities which connection to the communities of practice and mm -hmm. you know, uh, prior to school closures we were at a place where we would have like really great in-depth um, conversations and then we you know the question was like well this sounds amazing is it gonna work like you know can the teachers go back into the classroom and apply you know some of the greatness that was spoken about within those um, professional learning communities so it almost became like a, a cycle if you will like let's plan to see if this is gonna work let's do it and then let's come back and have you know meaningful discussions based upon what that was and i think that that assisted us with growing and so i guess my question um i don't know if it's a silly question or not but when you're referring to like the social learning spaces and the communities of practice um is that an area that um you would say would be a, a good thing to do or um you know just kind of like plan just kind of like do a cycle like test of change to see if the conversation that we're having actually works i just wanted to get a little bit of feedback on that yeah yeah great okay so so you're just anticipating where i was going so if we uh we were on slide 21 with the notion of a social learning space and let's go through that little cartoon now this little cartoon is made to to go pretty fast okay but the idea is 
that we are together and we care to make a difference. It, by the way, it doesn't need to be, to be, have a social learning space, it does not need necessarily to be the same difference that you care to make. Sometimes it is, but sometimes it isn't. As long as there is a learning partnership, even if you apply that in different ways and to, to, to make a difference somewhere else, it, it, it doesn't matter. But uh, if we move on slide 24, you know, to be together with people who recognize the difference you want to make, who recognize that it's important and who appreciate the kind of uncertainty that you have. That creates a certain feel, yeah, a certain context, you know. And then, uh, if you move to the next uh, 25, uh, out of this come ideas, solutions, what have you. And so, you discover new stuff. Very often, for people, learning ends there. But for us, learning continues. And I think I was, I'm going to address what you were saying, you know. Because what's important in Salai 26 is that you go back to your practice and you try it out. And learning continues because to try out an idea in practice is as much learning as coming up with the idea in the first place. It's as inventive as to try to come up with, to, with the idea in the first place. Go to your classroom and you have to reinvent that idea if somebody had, a, had an idea for how to teach something or something, like that, you have to reinvent that idea in that classroom with those kids, you know. So to put things in practice is as much learning as acquiring the idea in the first place. And then of course you see the effect, that will be slide number 27. And number 28, yeah, you come back. You come back to your colleagues in your, in your learning community and you say, how did that work? Oh, that was a disaster. Oh, why? Oh, huh, maybe this idea was not so great. Or maybe the idea was good, but you know, I think we should try to implement it in this way or that way. And so you can think of social learning as a kind of loop where you try things out, you get ideas in context where you feel something with others, you try things out and you bring it back. So yeah, I think, I think what you guys are doing, this idea that you're gonna try something in, in September and then get back together and say, okay, did it work or not? Is exactly what a social learning space should provide. You know? And it may become a committee of practice over time because over time, this accumulates into a. Pra if you do this, if you do this, over and over and over again, over time, you start having a practice. You start having, yeah, no, we know this works. We know this doesn't work, and you start having a practice. But that's that loop for us is fundamental to what we call social learning. Etienne, I think the most difficult part of your process is in this, what you might call the second part, um, and those appreciate the uncertainty. The appreciation of the uncertainty, I believe, is the most difficult part of the process. I think that's, I think that's true. I think that's true. But I think it's because we have this theory of knowledge that to know is to be certain. You know, as opposed to know is to, to, to learn is to engage uncertainty. You know, that's, that's where we would like to change things a bit, you know, to change the perspective a bit, you know. Especially, especially because what I said earlier is that our interactions with experts and highly skilled professionals 
Yeah, in fact, that's the way they live, you know. Um, do you feel that like the reintroduction of some improvisational like um, methodologies, like um, for example, like jazz music or um, acting and those, you know, some of the arts might help with that, you know, because um, it just seems to me that I'm always uh, going back to those fundamental um, kind of FAPA as I'm teaching STEM to special needs, I find myself bringing in a lot of those FAPA um, ideas and strategies. Mm -hmm. And it seems to uh, provide the, the environment and flexibility to have that kind of like jazzy discourse. Right. Yeah, I think uh, that's probably good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Because uh, some improvisational theater can, can teach people to both be open, be uncertain, and be, pay attention. I think in improvisational theater, you really have to pay attention to what comes back at you after you do something. So that you can, so, so, so yeah, that, that could be a, a, a good way to, um, yeah. And, and I think for a teacher, it's tricky, right? Especially I think today with the whole fake news thing and everything. Because uncertainty is also a weapon, you know? To, to hold people in a state of uncertainty is also a weapon. So it's a complicated concept, you know? Uh, but, you know, if we teach kids that the universe is 13 point, I don't remember exactly how much, 13.8 billion years old or something like this. We, we have to teach it to them by saying, okay, this is what science, what a, a committee of scientists has, have come up with. They're struggling with it. They hope it's right. They have good, good data. You cannot doubt it because not because it's true, but because you are not a member of that community. See what I mean? That's the idea of landscape versus facts, you know? The fact that 13.8 billion years old is the age of the universe is the product of a community that is in a learning process. And I cannot, I cannot debate that because I don't have the tools. I don't have the, the competence. So it's okay to accept another community's results because you don't belong to it. But that's, that, that, that's different from presenting it as a certainty. You know what I mean? And I think handling that is, is, is really important. Because, of course, politically, uncertainty is often used as a weapon. And so uh, we have to be very aware. It's, it's, it's a social, the it's a learning theory that's very politically self conscious, you know. Uh, and that's why the notion of a landscape is so important, you know, because it's like how do you orient yourself in a landscape? You know, we have to teach our kids how to orient themselves, you know. Because m my son the other day was telling me, uh, how can you trust the New York Times? I, I read the New York Times. That's how I get my political shot every day. He said, how can you tr trust the New York Times? It's a corporation. You know, they, they, need, to, they need to make money. So... What they tell you is the thing that's going to make them make, have them make money. And I was, I was, yeah, I, I thought it was good for him to be aware of that. But then I said, well, so where do you get your news? And he would say, oh, I get it from Facebook. And it was like, okay. So the reason why for me, I choose the New York Times rather than Facebook is because in my understanding of the landscape, the New York Times is more accountable to what they are saying 
than somebody posting something on Facebook. Because the punishment for saying something false on Facebook is very low. There's hardly any. Actually, I've heard some research that says that lies get more reposts than truth. Because lies tends to create an emotional reaction that makes people repose. And so, and I'm not saying you guys should read the New York Times. I'm not even saying my son should, should read the New York Times. I'm saying to have a sense of the landscape allows you to make certain choices about where you will invest your, your time, you know? And, and so I was just saying, that's my choice, you know, that I want, I want my, I want the source of my information to be punished <laughs> if they, if they mess up. Actually, the fact that, that somebody was saying, just recently I read an article where they were saying, yeah, scientists have changed their, their thing about coronavirus so many times since, since January. That's why you should trust them. You know, you should not trust people who don't self-correct, you know? So yeah, what they tell now is the best they know and it will probably change. But the fact that they self-correct is, is a good indication of trustworthiness. And I think, I think one thing that school needs to do nowadays is to help kids develop a sense of what is trustworthy and why. And why not? I think that's, that's a really important skill. Um, so uh, why did I start that big rant? <laughs> I don't even remember where I was, but anyway. So just in, unless you have a burning, a burning question or burning thing. I just wanted to show you something, some work that we're doing right now. Uh, based on that little cartoon, we are uh, trying to develop a, a framework to talk about the value created by learning. And um, since we have only very few minutes, why don't we just quickly look at that story uh, on, on slide 30. It's a story of a person who participated in a, in, a, in a project, in a learning project we were involved in to develop local government capacity in South, Southern and, and Southeastern Asia, where these countries are, tend to be very, very centralized and they wanted to devolve some services to local governments so that the service is rendered closer to the citizens. And uh, Funchuk, whose picture you can see on, on the slide 30, uh, was involved in a network in Bhutan where they wanted to put more women in local government. That's what they were trying to do. And she also belonged to the network that, that we were working with, which was an international network of people uh, working with local government. And there was a subset of that network dealing with the issue of gender representation in, uh, in, in, in local government. And so, I can, you, you can read the story yourself, but they basically organized a, a, a trip for them to visit another group in India that was doing similar work. They got a great idea there, which was to change the strategy depending on where you are in the election cycle went back to Bhutan, focused on women who had a high potential for being elected, taught them how to pass an, a literacy exam that you have to pass to stand, to stand for, for, for election. And uh, in that election, there was a, a, a substantial increase in the representation of women in local government. That kind of story for us has become an important, um, an important genre of story because in some ways it represents the cartoon. If you read that story, you will see the cartoon. 
you know, we fell in love when we, were, when we arrived in India, seeing what they were doing, it was so similar to what we were trying to do. You know, we got that great idea. We went back to Bhutan and we applied it in certain ways and so on and so forth. And, uh, and, and, and that, was, uh, that was the effect that we observed. These stories that follow the, the genre of the cartoon for us has, have become both a very important learning vehicle because when Funchuk brought back that story to her network, people were very inspired and, and they liked the fact that she gave the detail. She didn't say, hey, we went, we went to India, we had a great time and, and now we doubled the, the number of women in, in local government. She gave the detail of why they paid attention when they arrived there, what it is that they got, what it is that they did with it, and, and what, what was the result. So the fact that that story was following the genre of the cartoon made that story very informative for, um, uh, for the network. So these stories are a very important learning vehicle and we work with communities where this genre of stories become, like Iris was saying, you know, like a way to bring back to your community what you gained from the community, but enriched with the experience of having, of having tried it. And because time is very short, I just wanted to show you, um, if you jump now to slide number uh, 47, this is the framework that we introduced in that, in that new book which is the different ways that social learning creates value. And if you look at the, at the, at the four uh, rectangles inside the framework, you will, see, you will see the cartoon. What we call immediate value is like the value of being together, the value of discovering each other as learning partners. That's when Funchi say we fell in love. That's creating that context container as a social learning space. Potential value, the ideas that you get, the new knowledge that you get. The, we, call, we don't call it knowledge, by the way. We call it potential value because we don't know yet if it's knowledge. It has not been tried yet. Okay. So then going back, we say applied value. There is a lot of learning value to trying things out in practice. And then realize value what happened, what difference did it make uh, in the end? And just to give you some information in the last minute here, around there, we have noticed that groups and communities and, and networks that, have, that, that make a difference tend to also have what we call strategic value. Like, I, I don't know if you noticed, but in Fukchuk's story, she went back and she negotiated with local officials about the challenges that women were facing in standing for election. And actually they gave them gender uh, training. Um, uh, so engaging with stakeholders, we we'll call that strategic value. For you, it could be engaging with parents. It could be engaging with students themselves. Anybody who has a stake in what you are learning, uh, uh, the quality of relationship with, uh, that you have with them, we call it strategic value. Enabling value, we find that groups that really learn together well develop ways of learning together. They develop activities that work well. Uh, they develop trusts among each other uh, uh, to speak about failures and so on and so forth. So that's another kind of value. Orienting value has to do with how much you are aware of the landscape and how much you include that in your learning. And transformative value uh, is the effect beyond what you're trying, the difference you're trying to make. So like for instance, what happened in Funchuk's stories is that the women that she was working with not only were elected, but they felt an accountability to become role models for, for younger women uh, in, their, in their community. So it was also a transformation of their identity. It was not just a new role they were adopting, but it was also transforming their identity beyond the, the specific role uh, that they were elected for. Anyway, so we try to 
we try to uh, uh, explicate these different kinds of value, how they interact, how they form a, a complex view of social learning, and how it can be used for both supporting the learning of, of social learning spaces and also for evaluation. So we have a whole evaluation methodology that uses these kind of stories and indicators for these different types of value as a way to evaluate uh, the learning of a, of, a, of a group. Okay, so I've gone over two minutes already. <laughs> I, I'm free, I'm free to, to extend a little bit if you have questions, but you also have uh, kids to go to and all sorts of responsibility. So I think what we should do is, is kind of close the official uh, version of that, right, Laura? And then if you want to stay for a few minutes, if you, uh, I don't want to cut off any questions you have. So if, if those of you who want to stay for a few minutes, you're welcome to do that. But those of you who have responsibilities uh, in, your, in your life and need to run, there is uh, no shame in, uh, in doing that. Thank you, Dr. Wenger. I appreciate that. If anyone is about to leave, I just wanted to recommend that you go to the Sketch app um, because we do have a, an evaluation form for everyone to complete. So please make sure you go to the SCED app and complete the evaluation form. There's also a link Mike is putting in the chat. So um, please complete that. That'll help us to.